Okay, again, in keeping with the uh, concept here of the ATM short talks to try and get you um, get a head sense of what's going on with telescope making and, and mirror quality. This particular talk here that I'm going to do is uh, uh, just an introduction to the idea of mirror quality. As I said before, when you're making any kind of a project, you need to have a project and you have to have some kind of standard for the result. And the standard for the result ends up being the limits of how good your mirror has to be. And I'm going to just really try to put my practical hat on and give you some, some, some guidance here. There's a lot you can read and the internet is full of all kinds of things. So I want to just, uh, it's really about three things that I'm going to talk about here. Is uh, the established, what the established standards are for a good mirror. And it's just a primer, an introduction, but I hope you find it of value. I'm going to examine the most common one, which many of you may have heard of, and that would be the core wave Rayleigh limit, and then discuss what is realistic to achieve. Um, I showed you this slide last time, the Pratt-Loyal Donut, and I talked a little bit about how you measure your telescope mirror to um, make sure that when you're comparing it to a sphere, and you come up with those measurements, and you measure it against a parabola. You can take that same table of information and convert it into, into uh, some kind of error measurement. It's crude, but it can be done. You're starting here, again, with a longitudinal aberration. We did that before, so I'm going to go right to the standards. Ideally, if we're to live in an ideal world, light from an infinitesimally small point would focus to a point with no size. But we don't live in, a, in an ideal world. We have physics to worry about, and light from a star, which is an infinitesimally small point, a point of light with no size, is going to focus into a, a point spread function, which is a, a disk of a finite size surrounded by a family of rings, the first ring being the brightest and then getting successively dimmer from there on. The diameter of the airy disk in the spacing of the rings is related to the aperture of the mirror, but the intensity of the light in the center is related to how close your parabola is, how good that you can make it. That is actually a side picture of the point spread function. A, a two-dimensional light-dark shot like I just showed doesn't give you an idea of how much light is in that airy disk. And the light is 84% of the light in the disk, and the rest of the light is distributed amongst these rings. And that's the first ring and the second ring, and then they get progressively dimmer so that you can see them. Oops. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. There we go. There are two common criteria that you're probably going to hear about mostly. The first is the Rayleigh criteria. It came about from some writings that Lord Rayleigh did in 1879, uh, where he defined this. Um, he, there was stuff he was going on historically that made him work on that. He didn't come up with it totally out of nowhere. The other criteria is the Danjon and Coder criteria. You may have heard less of it, but if you read Texero's book on how to make a telescope, that's the criteria he uses. It took me many years to figure it out. Uh, and, that, and that's why I want to make sure I point it out to you. So if you're reading Texero and he starts talking about this criteria, he does talk about quarter wave that you don't get confused between the two criteria. First, the Rayleigh criteria, the quarter wave, his words uh, that he published when he wrote it is that we may consider that aberration begins to decided, be decidedly prejudicial when the wave's surface deviates from its proper place by about a quarter of a wavelength. And in his paper, he is talking about aberration. He's not talking about local errors. He's talking about differences, presumably with uh, spherical aberration, differences between center to the edge. And uh, I'll explain the quarter wave in a little bit. But the typical interpretation of, of that fancy English language is that an optic should be made such that the optical path difference between the center and the edge should be within one quarter of the wavelength of light. This is the wavelength of light that the telescope is being used for, by the way. The gamma, if you do it gamma rays, it's going to be different. 
uh, should be a quarter wave or or better. Uh, and he says that you will, it's decided, it's, that's when you start to notice it. So we say that if your quarter wave are better, you actually have a, a very good telescope. Let me try to explain a little bit of what this means. If you have parallel rays of light coming from outer space, uh, the wave front is uh, a graphical representation used in the old days to help understand light, but we still use it today. The wave front is, is perpendicular to the light wave, so they're going to be wave fronts, kind of like waves come into a beach. The, the waves actually come toward the beach, but the, the crests of the waves are all are parallel to the beach. And so this is wave front, and if it go, once it goes through an optical system, then the light rays come to a focus. It's no longer parallel light rays. Hopefully your optical system produces a, a, a conical ray of waves uh, that are coming together with spherical wave fronts. And of course I'm showing each wave front separated by a, a wavelength or so. And if you can imagine that, that these shells here are, if you want to think of two shells that are a quarter wave apart, then what he's saying with his criteria is that between the center and the edge, assuming that everything else is otherwise smooth, that if, if this distance is no more than a quarter of a wave, then that's probably, you, you're going to just barely start to see it. Um, it can be better than that, but it doesn't have to be much better than that because that's, that's awful darn good. Now, if your mirror is slightly uh, oblate, it's not completely a parabola, then the edge rays are still going to leave the center rays, and if it's a little beyond the parabola, no, high, uh, hyperbola, the center rays are going to leave the edge rays, but as long as it's smooth and you're between these two quarter wave shells, then your mirror is, uh, is you really ought to be pretty proud of your mirror. It's not necessarily to mean anything goes. Lord Rayleigh uh, didn't really address in his writings local deformations, and what affects how your light focuses is really slow rather than distant. So if you start getting irregularities that are too close together, you can have a steep slope. So Lord Rene was pretty clear that he was talking about smooth mirrors and uh, an, an aberration of smooth from the center to the edge. But that's where the quarter wave comes from. But I want to bring that out because if someone says, well, I got a quarter of a wave turned edge, it's still within the Rayleigh limit, uh, it may not be. Now, the Dan Jones and Coder criteria is a little bit different. And he approaches it from a different way. He's looking to see whether the light is all inside the areas. So the term, he has actually two things that he uses. One is that the, the geometric image of least confusion in the plane of focus should not exceed the size of the theoretical area disk. And the other is the maximum wavefront error must not exceed a quarter of a wavelength of light, and the defect should be much less than this over most of the surface. So here is introduced a little bit of, uh, of local ir irregularity allowed, still meaning within the quarter wave. So he still talks about the quarter wave, but now they got that from Lord Rayleigh's writings, but he's more interested in this geometric image of least confusion. So let's just discuss what that might be. If I have a spherical surface, and I am subjecting that to rays coming from outside, uh, a parallel light beam. I haven't shown the parallel light beam coming in because it confused the picture. I'm just showing the light leaving the mirror. And the clear here is sometimes not But anyway, here comes the light. The center rays are going to focus closer than the edge rays. The edge rays focus the further out. And every zone in between is going to focus somewhere between those two points. That's a longitudinal aberration. And I'm just going to blow that up so you can see how the ray bundles cross. I've uh, just shown the middle and the edge and the center of the mirror, but I think draw a lot more of them. But the, the point that you would see is that there is some area where there's a minimum diameter to that light bundle. And that is called, in his terms, the circle of least confusion. I, I don't know who makes up these terms, but nevertheless, that's what it is. Now, if it turns out that that circle of least confusion is all in the airy disk, you could argue, that, well, the smallest spot I'm going to get is the airy disk anyway, so if my rays of light are all going to fit inside the airy disk, I'm as good as I need to be. And that's the simple, uh, the simple way to think of what his criteria is meaning. It, it still has an influence on the actual distribution of the point grid function. But I mean, I'm just trying to get a, a head sense here for you of how that works. But anyway, so let's examine the quarter wave standard, because I think 
you're all, that's what you're all going to be hearing, hearing about. You're going to be asking yourself, am I within the four ways limit or, or not? If you were to consider a perfect optic, or if you were just to consider a hole with no optic at all, you're still going to get a point spread function. That's a function of diffraction. And with perfect optics, you're going to get 84% of light in the airy disk. The rest of the 16% is going to be distributed among the rings. If you have a 16th of a wave, again, the mirror being smooth, we're just talking about correction for spherical aberration, you've got 83% of the light in the airy disk and the rest distributed in the rings. Not much difference, is there? Eighth of a wave, now you've got 80% of the light in the ring. The area is going to be the same size. Rings are going to be the same size. There's just going to be a difference in light distribution. Until you get more than half wave, then other things probably start happening, or probably quite a bit more. But this is the range we're talking about, because we can easily test within that range. We can figure our mirrors within this range. By the time you get to be half wave, 40% of the light is in the area this long. So I decided to plot that up to see what it looks like, to see what the sensitivity is here. And it's interesting, it's, it's a linear curve for a while, but then it's no longer linear. You see that from a half wave, you get 40% of the light in the airy disk, and when light goes into the ring, that's where your resolution and contrast goes with the wave. You think of that airy disk as a pixel. You know, now that we all have computers and we have pictures are made of pixels, and the smaller and more intense the light can be in a pixel, the better the resolution is. Well, if that light starts going into the other ring, now you're making the pixel bigger, and your contrast goes down and your detail goes down. So that's why it's important to have the light in the airy disk. But here you got 40% at a half wave, by the time you get to a quarter wave, you've made a significant improvement. You now you're talking at the quarter wave rate limit, the mathematics of that come out, that the 68% the of light in the airy disk and the rest is in the rings. When you get the eighth wave, you get 80% of the light in the airy disk. And I mean, that's getting pretty good. The maximum we can get is 84. And if you look at the 16th of a wave, you, you really got about 83% out of 84% of light in the air disk. So I think this is, to me, this is re really pretty telling here that you're making big improvements in your optics up until you get to be about eight of a wave, and then you, you're sort of reaching the point of actual diminishing returns. I just magnified the, the section here to show that, uh, again, a little closer look that at eighth of a wave, you got 80% uh, of light. By the time you get at a tenth of a wave, you got 81.6 or almost 82% of the light in the airy disk. The Fransol limit, by the way, uh, was defined I guess, somewhere. He, he came to the conclusion that in the 16th of a wave, it's just useless to figure a mirror anymore. You're just not going to see the difference. And that's because there's 83% of light in the airy disk. Uh, now we're talking ground based telescopes here, people use them in backyards, probably even professional ones at the time. The point is, you've got 83% of light in the airy disk, and the maximum you can get possibly 84, you're talking one part out of 100. Are you ever going to see the difference? And so a reasonable argument could be, well, pro I mean, you know, probably not. And I, I would be willing to argue here at a tenth of a wave with almost 82% of the light in the airy disk with a possible of 84. I challenge anyone in this room to honestly tell me they can tell that difference. And the reason I want to bring this up is because, again, this is, you know, hopefully you're all thinking about making your first telescope mirrors, and I want you to make the mirror. I'm not, I really would hope that you don't be labor and work for three years to try to get a 40th of a wave mirror. Keep the battle, because you're going to put a lot of work into it, and yet the return's not going to be there. Now, if you're running a contest or something else, sure, go for it. There are ways that can be measured more, but as a practical matter, if you get to a tenth of a wave, you, you're really going to be, you're going to have an awfully good mirror, probably about as good as you need to have it, you know, for earthbound telescopes looking through sky and clouds and everything else we look through. And a quarter wave, let me, when you go back and look at this quarter wave, there's something else I probably ought to point out for you. This quarter wave at the Rayleigh limit, you've got 68% of your light in your airy disk. There are other aberrations that can cause that same change. Um, a central obstruction of 33% is also going to give you that same distribution of light. It's a different aberration, but it puts 68% of light in the central area disk and the rest of the ring. So it, it's, it's equivalent performance. 
And I know you've all looked through Astronomy Magazine and you've looked through uh, Sky and Telescope Magazine and you've seen these wonderful pictures in the galleries there. You can have planetary things, you've got Mars, you can see all the planetary detail stuff that almost the Hubble could take. And if any of them were taken with a schmidt cassegrain telescope that has a 33% central obstruction, that's still when it was 68% of light in the area distance and the rest of it distributed because of the large central obstruction. So I just want to point out here that a quarter wave telescope under ideal conditions, under good conditions, yeah, you could argue that there's some softness to the image if you really experience it, as Lord Rene wrote about. But by the time you get to a tenth of a wave, then you're probably going to be as good as you need to get, as long as we're talking peak to valley and that the mirror is otherwise smooth. We're talking errors here of just correction difference. A true parabola is never achievable. And I think there's another, there's an article, if you get a chance to read it, um, it's a, a sky and telescope back in March of 1992, and I apologize, the picture's blurry enough you can't read it, but there's an article here on optical quality and telescopes by Peter Cerebello and Terence Dickinson. They made a series of telescopes, and we actually have these, if we don't have these telescopes, we have something similar here at Stellafane. There are three telescopes, one that's a half wave, one that was a quarter wave, and one that was a tenth of a wave. And the idea was that he took people, and he, very experienced observers, and he lined them all up, and he asked them to look at the telescopes and tell the difference between the two of them. And most of the people could tell a half wave from a quarter wave, but by the time you get to the quarter wave, separating that from the eighth of a wave, it took a very experienced observer with side-by-side -side, uh, looking at a very clear night in order to really tell the difference. So I just want to try to put that in perspective for you, because I want you to make mirrors. I don't want you to have a mirror sitting in your basement for three years and you're trying to get a twentieth of a wave into valley out. Go make another mirror if you want. And we can enter it in the optical competition up here. Go for it. Any questions? Have I uh, made any sense? Okay. Any, 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 anything I can uh, add? Anybody would like to? I did the primer for you. Okay. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the lecture.